Hello everybody. Uh, apologies for not being with you in person, uh, but I was taken suddenly ill a few weeks ago. But thanks to the swift and skillful intervention of my colleagues in the ambulance and emergency departments, I'm here to tell the tale. I want to describe our work in Ukraine, which is founded on two organisations that I have helped develop over the last 30 years. The first is UK Med, which is an international NGO, non-government organisation, uh, a charity. Uh, you can go to its website here. It's an international medical charity, as I say, and we can send individual experts or teams of experts or full medical or surgical teams to humanitarian emergencies around the world. And also, I would draw your attention to the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute uh, at the University of Manchester, uh, a unique institute that sits alongside the international NGO UK Med and HCRI uh, carries out research uh, into humanitarian uh, interventions as well as um, running a number of degree courses. Uh, UK Med is hosted by the University of Manchester, uh, but is entirely independent. But UK Med and HCRI actually sit physically alongside each other uh, in the university and each supports the work of the other. The war in Ukraine, as we are now all painfully aware, began over 12 months ago and shows no sign of abating. UK Med was on the ground there within weeks of the outbreak of the conflict and has remained there ever since. The war has had and continues to have an enormous economic and personal impact on the people of Ukraine. Uh, I googled some basic facts about the impact of the war some months ago now and the losses in terms of life, in terms of the wounded, in terms of the economy have only increased ever since. But what qualifies UK Med to respond to a disaster of this scale and of this type? Well, as an organisation, we have been at the forefront of promoting professionalism in medical humanitarian responses and the need for accountability and the establishment and maintenance of core standards. We have and continue to work very closely with the World Health Organization in support of their emergency medical teams initiative. And currently UK Med is the only NGO emergency medical team in the UK that has been formally verified by WHO as meeting their minimum standards and criteria for classification. This picture shows the team being formally presented with its EMT flag following the lengthy WHO verification process, which we successfully completed. UK Med is also qualified to respond to a conflict such as that in Ukraine, as we've done it before. For example, throughout the war in Bosnia, we worked in Sarajevo, delivering emergency medical aid for almost four years continuously throughout the siege of Sarajevo. We know what the needs are, and we could therefore respond quickly and appropriately to meet the needs of the people in Ukraine. Outside surgical assistance in a country such as Ukraine that already has a large surgical capacity is needed mostly in support of reconstructive surgery for war injuries and the rehabilitation of the war injured. Obviously, it is those present at the site of wounding, usually soldiers at the battlefront, who will be responsible for the immediate life-saving surgery. But there is a terrible death toll from infection of incurred in battlefield injuries and a terrible toll on disability from prolonged wound infection and sometimes avoidable amputation. The provision of additional plastic and reconstructive surgeons to work alongside of and in support of the local surgeons is what we did successfully in Sarajevo and that we have repeated now in Ukraine. The experience in Sarajevo and other conflicts has also prepared UK Med to manage the serious risks to our volunteers when deploying into conflict. 
working in Sarajevo, for example, meant that you could go overland uh, the long journey over the mountains, which was very risky, or take the equal risk of flying in on the airlift, which was with rather dark humour called maybe airlines. And you can see that it actually labelled it as such when you join the queue for those hoping to get on the airlift to get in or out of Sarajevo. And I'm the proud bearer of a maybe airlines stamp in my passport. Maybe airlines because maybe you could get a place on it and maybe if you did, maybe you might arrive in one piece. In Sarajevo, we worked closely with the British Association of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgeons and the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to provide a continuous rotation of specialist surgical teams in and out of Sarajevo. We call this Operation Phoenix and you can read about it here. We also provided continuous supplies of specialist surgical equipment. The rotation of surgical teams and supplies of specialist surgical equipment is being repeated now by our teams in and across Ukraine. By way of further background, as well as deploying independently, UK Med is also a partner in the UK government's UK emergency medical team, the first emergency medical team in Europe to be verified by WHO. Although the UK government did not deploy its emergency medical team into Ukraine, it did gift its large field hospital to UK Med, which we transported overland to replace an operating theatre complex near to the front line that had been shelled by Russian artillery. We did this at the very beginning of the war and it is still operational. You can see the size and extent uh, of the field hospital that we transported to Ukraine. I am not at liberty to tell you exactly where it is because it was targeted and also when uh, we deployed the field hospital, it was targeted again, but we've managed to put all its component parts uh, underground, well protected, and it provides a very useful function. As you are aware, I'm sure Ukraine is now a no-fly zone. To gain access, I first flew to Krakow in Poland and then drove overland the 200 or so miles to Lviv. You can see Lviv there on the west of Ukraine. UK Med has an operational base there where I was initially billeted. Our team in Lviv works closely with uh, Ukraine staff at the emergency hospital. This is a large tertiary referral centre that provides specialist medical and surgical facilities for the whole of Ukraine. In peacetime, not only injured patients, but patients who required specialist cancer treatment or complex surgery would be transferred to this hospital. Now, of course, access is very difficult. The injured from the front line have to be transferred by hospital train for up to a thousand miles. Medical support for the hospital train is provided by MSF. It is not just the injured from the front line that require transfer, but also those requiring other specialist services. Patients will be in Lviv for some considerable time as it's very difficult for them to return to their hometowns so near to the front line and have to be accompanied by their relatives, which places an additional burden on the hospital and on the local health and social facilities. We are supporting plastic and reconstructive surgery for war injuries uh, in Lviv and also additional support to infection prevention and control. An often forgotten and certainly underestimated component of the surgical response to any humanitarian emergency is the need for extensive and usually prolonged rehabilitation. For example, I deployed a surgical team to the Sichuan earthquake in China some years ago that was in country for a month, but a spinal injury rehabilitation team that we deployed was there for over two years. Similarly, in Gaza, we deployed a surgical team that was there uh, in country for several weeks to deal with the immediate consequences of the conflict. But a rehabilitation team was there for over six months. 
We have a team in Turkey now following the earthquake, but we know that the rehabilitation needs will last for months and probably years. The rehabilitation needs in Ukraine are immense. We are supporting the development of a fledgling rehabilitation unit in Lviv, and there is an urgent need for limb prostheses. The Ukrainian medical staff are highly motivated and they've called their program of rehabilitation and restoration of services unbroken. This they apply to the resilience of their patients and the resilience of the country as a whole. So much is summed up in this picture. I'm not breaking any confidences as the picture is on public display in the emergency hospital in Lviv. The injured woman is a nurse from that hospital and here she is with her fiance shortly before they were married. Travelling from Lviv to Poltava is impossible by train. I was extremely impressed by the way the Ukrainian people continue as much as they can with what passes for a normal life. People go to the shops and continue to go to cafes. The train services run on time. A Ukrainian refugee in the UK was interviewed on the radio recently and was asked what she missed most about Ukraine or found frustrating about living in the UK. And she said the rail services. Seats go down to give a bed of sorts, which was just about bearable for the 17 hour journey. Trains have to travel slowly because of the risk of damage to the tracks. And there is always the threat of a missile attack. Having arrived in Poltava from Lviv, I met up with our team at our Poltava base. We run a number of mobile clinics in and around Poltava. I met with the regional medical officer of health who pointed out that over 200,000 people had been displaced into Poltava within a matter of weeks at the start of the war and the struggle he had to provide them with basic continuing health care. Hence the need for primary care clinics, for mobile clinics, and a gap that we are trying to fill. As well as providing clinics and surgical teams, where we are also providing, at the request of the Ukrainian authorities, training in CBRN and in advanced trauma training for the general public. At the front line, there can be an inevitable delay in the provision of emergency help. And so we are training first responders and the public themselves in how to manage severe injuries until the emergency services can gain access. From Poltava, I travelled overland by car for several hours to Dnipro in the south. This is now where we have our main headquarters. There are constant missile attacks. On my first evening, there were 55 cruise missiles fired into Ukraine many of which went over where I was trying to get some sleep. You could hear the air defense systems hitting the missiles. They, manage, they do manage to shoot down the majority, but of course not all. And what is often not fully understood is the damage caused by the falling debris from the missiles that have been destroyed and the death toll that, su that such debris can itself inflict on the population. While I was in Dnipro, a young pregnant woman was killed by falling debris as she was simply trying to fill her car at the gas station. I was taken around the local uh, fire and rescue service station where the, we are training uh, firefighters in advanced trauma life support. And they showed me the debris of a recent uh, missile that had uh, landed in the city. Missile attacks are continuous and I took this footage uh, from a car not long after yet another air raid. The destruction to Ukraine is terrible and the reconstruction, the physical reconstruction alone is going to take a long time 
and cost many billions of dollars. Dnipro is near to the front line and many patients are treated there prior to their further evacuation westwards towards Lviv. We also provide specialist surgical support to the surgeons there. And here I am handing over a hundred thousand pounds worth of surgical equipment to help support the hospital. Dnipro has had to expand its hospital capacity and a paediatric hospital has now been converted to house additional adult surgical beds for the war wounded. They have in fact converted a laundry into a surgical ward and another part of the laundry into an additional operating theatre. You can see here in the paediatric intensive care unit, blackout curtains on the windows and sandbags up against the bottom of the windows. I found it rather touching and in many ways heartbreaking to see how they'd covered the sandbags with child-friendly motifs to try and give the parents of the little children on the ventilators some semblance of normality. From Dnipro, I went further north, very close to the front line. First of all, to Kharkiv, that has recently been taken back from Russian occupation, and then further towards the battlefront to Stary Saltiv. You could hear the pounding of the heavy artillery and the movement of air as the shells exploded. We were, of course, guided at all times by the Ukrainian authorities to make sure we were just out of range. But the population is returning to these areas quickly and they need healthcare support. And so we have established our furthermost outpost there in Stary Saltiv with a primary care clinic. The signs of battle are everywhere. The whole area has been mined, and although every attempt has been made to clear them, you have to be extremely careful and avoid walking anywhere other than in the middle of a well-traveled road. We are carrying out CBRN training Drawing, drawing on our experience of supporting those working in Syria during the conflict. Working with WHO, we established and ran a contaminated casualty emergency trauma course, training people to manage safely casualties injured by chemical weapons or dirty bombs, for example, and safely managing their care from the roadside to the operating theater. There is a continuing threat of contaminated injuries in Ukraine. Nuclear, uh, nuclear power plants are under constant threat. And there is a continuing fear of a dirty bomb being exploded over the Black Sea. This is one of our training sessions at the Fire and Rescue uh, Service in Dnipro, uh, where the firefighters are being trained in advanced trauma care, but also as part of the day's training program, we also uh, train them in the safer management of contaminated casualties. When looking at our overall program, it is important to understand the range of needs required in response to any humanitarian emergency, including conflict. It is not just the direct consequences of the emergency, such as crush injuries in an earthquake or wounding in conflict that require treatment. The emergency itself causes significant and long lasting disruption to healthcare systems. There is an equal and sometimes greater need to support a general emergency healthcare service and indeed maintain such a service and a healthcare service for those with chronic conditions. It is to this end that we run primary care clinics and mobile clinics across Ukraine alongside our more specialized and focused reconstructive surgery programs. The clinics are well attended and, sub and supported by the local health authorities who advise us where best 
to place our clinics because they know well uh, where the needs are. Uh, power cuts are a continuous nuisance for us there, but you will notice that the uh, strategic use of Halloween pumpkin lanterns uh, prove very effective. The national security system in Ukraine is very impressive. You are given continuous alerts on your mobile phone. There's actually been a test of a national alert system recently in the UK, but this is already in operation in Ukraine. We also subscribe to an independent security advisor who gives us more focused and detailed uh, security alerts. And I did rather like the cool, all clear message of no worries. As I've said, uh, restaurants try their best to keep open. There is a great determination to maintain normal life in these highly abnormal circumstances. There is an evening curfew and alcohol cannot be served after 5 p.m. So people go out uh, earlier than they would normally. And I was impressed by the strength of the people to keep city life continuing. But I was also saddened to see this placemat for children to colour in in a restaurant that showed how quickly war has been incorporated into their young lives and how slowly it will be removed. I was reminded that Ukraine has a long turbulent history and its relationship with Russia has always been tortuous. In Dnipro, there are many reminders of this difficult relationship. Here's a palace built by General Potemkin for Catherine the Great. She regarded Ukraine as part of Russia, but she never actually went there. The palace was never used. It eventually became an art college. And here too is a memorial to the bereaved mothers of the Second World War, which sadly is as relevant now as it was 80 years ago. So what for UK Med now in Ukraine? Well, we are still there and we will remain there as long as the Ukrainian authorities ask for our support. We are now registered as a charity in Ukraine and employ Ukrainian healthcare workers. This month, we are running a conference with our Ukrainian colleagues in Kiev. The conference will draw on the lessons from the surgical treatment of war casualties in a civilian setting from which we can all learn and there will be a publication after the uh, conference that will be shared widely. UKMED also continues, continues its wider work. We responded to the earthquake in Turkey where we still have teams on the ground. We also responded to a WHO call for assistance in managing a large cholera outbreak in Malawi. And again, we continue to have teams on the ground there. The war in Ukraine sadly shows no sign of abating anytime soon. And although moved off the humanitarian headlines by the terrible humanitarian emergency unfolding in Sudan, UK Med will continue to be prepared to help wherever and whenever it can. Thank you for your attention.